Okay. Hey everyone, welcome to our fifth presenter presentation today on the first day of the Caring Conference, Our Resilient Spirit. And Beverly is going to share her insights about resilience. Beverly, take it away. Okay. Life is not easy. Um, and I doubt that I would find anyone who would disagree. Resilience. Um, when we learn how to become resilient, we learn how to embrace the beautifully broad spectrum of the human experience. That's a quote by Jada DeWalt. I'm into quotes. I really like quotes to kind of start my day off. I really appreciate this opportunity to speak about resilience. I'm honored to be among other fantastic presenters. Resilience is a capacity to bounce back from difficulties. And I believe not only bounce back, but move forward. I'm, um, it's what keeps us going and in the face of stress and anxiety and life's uncertainties. I've never really thought of myself in, in terms of resilient. As a matter of fact, when Denise put out the call for speakers, I didn't really think of myself as being resilient. You just kind of go through life and that's what it is. So this is an overview of my presentation. It's what is resilience? Who am I? A couple of stories and my takeaways, bouncing forward, develop, create, and learn resilience. Do it anyway and take care of yourself. Um, I might be talking too fast. I'm a fast talker. I'll try to slow down. Um, as Denise said, my name is Beverly Nance. I am a mother, a daughter, a friend, a civic leader, entrepreneur, author, and a lifelong learner. That's what I consider myself. Um, as an entrepreneur, I founded Puzzabilities, which is a custom jigsaw puzzle company. We make pictures. Um, we make puzzles from your pictures and artwork, and we also make um, puzzles for also Alzheimer's and autism. That's right, really my sweet spot, really I, I want to get into and stay into. And we also make the accessories. Also, I am the founder of Take Care Time, which is a blog and e-commerce site that caters to caregivers. Additionally, I am building a community of caregivers who want to share their wisdom and support with other caregivers and take care of themselves while doing so. This community is a Facebook group called Caregiving Life, and it's for family caregivers and caregivers by profession or anyone just interested in caregiving. Um, it sort of has turned into people start looking for caregiving jobs, which I'm trying to get away from. A lot of people will um, post that they're looking for a caregiver or post that they're looking for a caregiver job, but that's not initially what it was intended for. I am an author of a book called Take Care. It was on the first slide, Caring for Yourself While Caring for Others. And I am the co-author of a book called Driven Success. And that book explores what drives entrepreneurs and their brands. And there's maybe like 10 to 15 other authors in that book. Both of those are on Amazon. I am an avid volunteer and I am a board member of my local autism group in the county in which I live. Additionally, my prize is that I am retired from the U.S. Postal Service. I worked there for almost 35 years. Okay. When I was, uh, wait a minute, let me go back. Because um, when I was younger, I, like I said, I didn't really consider myself resilient. I didn't realize that my life experiences were building up my resilience, were teaching me the art of bouncing back throughout the years because I was just living. The teachings and guidance of my parents provided to and for me, helped me build up my resilience and strengthened me for life's challenges. And it wasn't only my parents' teaching and guidance that helped me build up my resilience. I also learned by doing things anyway. You know, when people would tell you things are not gonna work, I would just do it anyway. Um, that way I didn't have to live with a life of regret, wondering what would happen if I had done this or, or not. I just did it anyway. And I, when I think back, um, when I was preparing for this talk, I was thinking back at some pivotal moments in my life that made me, me. And one of them was when I was a junior in high school, the, the slide is of um, is kind of old, and it's a program for this program called Checkmates. And I found that recently in some of my mother's old stuff because my mother passed away in 2019. We were going 
through her things and settling her estate. And I found that. So I just put it up there. I had some pictures. I couldn't find the pictures. But when I was a student in junior high school, it's junior high school on the West Coast, but out here it's called middle school, a woman named Teddy Gentry and came to our school recruiting students for a volunteer project. It was through the NCNW, and that project was called Checkmates. It paired junior high school students with senior living, seniors living in care facilities. And sadly, back then it was called old folks homes. I don't know if any of you ever heard of that term, but I'm glad they, you know, you don't hear that much anymore. I was excited because it was a chance to earn extra credit and it seemed like um, an adventure. All the potential volunteers, you know, we had to interview in order to volunteer. And of course we had to get our parents permission. Once we got past that hurdle, we had to make our own shirts, which were blue and white checkered. That's why we were called checkmates. And we made our shirts from Butterwick patterns. If any of you ever sew, not too many people sew anymore, but you know, they had Butterwick and then the Vogue were the more expensive patterns. But anyway, we learned uh, some things about sewing in school because kids took home ec back then. I'm not sure if they do anymore. You know, the girls would take uh, cooking and sewing and the boys would do wood shop and metal. I'm kind of dating myself. So we made our shirts and our parents had to provide white pants for us. So my mom took me to what was in Sears and Roebuck. I'm not even sure if Sears is in business anymore, but back then it was called Sears and Roebuck. Roebuck was still a part of it. And then Miss Gentry, she provided our hats and we were ready to do our first day as checkmates. My first memory of walking through the door was the smell that hit me. Um, it might have been just me, but it was an odd smell for a place like that. Um, I felt I was still excited, even with the smell, because I felt like, you know, in my uniform, we had our little badges with our names written on them. And I just felt important. <laughs> you know, here I was in junior high school and I'm going to go do this job. And I felt like I was a registered nurse. But most of the time was spent, and it was enjoyable time, spent carrying food trays, getting ice water, reading, and, and most importantly, we were listening to the residents. And there was one resident that really intrigued me. I became drawn to her. Not only did she open up to me about her journey that landed her there, she was also interested in why I was there. And when I told her I was part of a school, she opened up and she told me about her family. And over time, we would gossip and we would laugh about the other residents and staff. And she tickled me and she made me laugh. And it just felt like um, we were in on conversations that were just ours. And clearly, you know, she would, of course, anybody living in a senior facility would rather be at home, but here she was. So over time, the staff would um, help put her in her wheelchair and we would take time to go out to the courtyard and Miss Penny, that was her name, she always tried to get up and I would ask her, why are you trying to get up? Because it's so much easier just being in a wheelchair and just being pushed. And she told me something that was, it didn't really resonate with me at the time, but she told me that when you stop moving, you stop living. And I assumed she was talking physically Maybe she was, but years later, it was just profound to me that she said that, and it always stuck with me. I really enjoyed my time at the Euclid, what's called Euclid Avenue Convalescent Home. I enjoyed my time there. And when our program was up, I asked my mom if she would still take me there to volunteer. And so I spent a few more months volunteering um, there at the Convalescent Home. And, you know, summer turned into fall and the new school year began. I went to say my goodbyes and I, I dropped off a one of two maracas that I had from shopping in Tijuana because we lived in San Diego. It was close to shopping in Tijuana. And I, I had these maracas that hung on my wall and they kind of hung up like this if you've ever seen them. And so I gave Miss Penny one and I told her that she could just shake it and she can keep moving. And if you're wondering, what does that have to do with resilience? Well, resilience starts with observation. And Miss Penny, here she was living in a place that was not her home. And she was still moving, she was still smiling, and she tried. The place smelled, the food was lousy, and I never saw many visitors. 
Yet here this senior was living her life in what looked to be isolation at times and various forms of decline. And she exuded resiliency. And I didn't know it at the time, but I learned from her to model that behavior. Years later, after I graduated from high school, I attended college and I began my career at USPS. You never guess who my manager was. It was Ms. Gentry, the lady who had recruited me for this position at the senior citizen facility. So it's funny, you know, how life can go in circles and then your experiences can come full circle. So my second story, I became um, a mother. Well, first I got married in 1988 and I became a mother to a son in 1990. Three years later, I gave birth to a daughter. My ex-husband, my son and my daughter and myself, we lived at a quiet cul-de-sac in San Diego, California. That's where I'm from. And he was from Oakland, California. We met at work, we married and had two kids. And when my daughter didn't show any interest in talking, I took her to the doctor to see what was wrong. Um, I was comparing her to my son who hit all of his milestones right on time. Um, that's all I could compare her to. And my doctor, the doctors, as well as my friends, you know, they told me stop worrying. You know, she would talk when she was ready. And, you know, as a mother, I knew something was wrong. And it took almost four long years for my daughter to get finally get diagnosed with autism. And it wasn't my HMO that diagnosed her. And it's frustrating when clearly there's something wrong because she's not talking and you can't receive any services without a diagnosis. I ended up having to hire an attorney. And as it turned out, the attorney had two sons who uh, were on the autism spectrum and her husband was an attorney. So I really felt like I was in good hands. Not only did she guide me through the process of getting a proper diagnosis, she sued. She sued the school district, San Diego Unified School District. They were out of compliance at the time. So I was able to receive services through the Center for Autism Related Disorders because they were out of compliance. Watching her work and lift me up during times when I wanted to quit has been a lifelong benefit to me as a mother. She put me in contact with professionals that helped my daughter receive services that she would not otherwise have been able to receive. And she went far beyond her professional lawyer duties. She turned a whole lot of no's into yeses. And not only that, she was based in Los Angeles. So she drove all the way from Los Angeles to San Diego to represent me in a lot of these meetings. And because she sued the San Diego Unified School District, they picked up the cost. So that was a bonus. <laughs> um, with autism, I later found out the earlier the diagnosis, the better the outcome because you can receive inter interventions earlier. And unfortunately for my daughter, that was not the case because it took so long to get a diagnosis. Um, autism is a really hard diagnosis and I'm not saying that other disabilities are not, but for me, um, it was really hard. My daughter, she's on the lower end of the autism spectrum, which, you know, it goes from savant all the way to the lower functioning. And she will need assistance for her entire life. I didn't quit. I kept going. I was fortunate to have resilient people in my life who encouraged me and guided me to do a lot of stepping out on faith that greatly benefited my daughter. I can honestly say that I still have challenging days. There's still, you know, some things that are going on because she's getting older. And, you know, I fall into despair sometimes, but I don't stay there. The singer Joan Baez, she said, action is the antidote to despair. So I keep going and I choose to do it anyway. So you're I'm wondering, what is it? It's advocating, it's volunteering, it's learning, it's failing, it's choosing to lead um, by example and to learn from example of other people. I've met a lot of parents with autistic kids and they will tell you that it's a kick in the teeth when you get that diagnosis. Not every parent will be moved into action and some, and in some way I want to be an encouragement to them. And I want to not only have them encourage me, but I wanna be their encourager. And I want to hold parents up until they can stand on their own. 
So um, let me go back to that quiet cul-de-sac. If you remember, I told you I lived on a quiet cul-de-sac in San Diego. Well, it was looked very nice on the outside, but it was not idyllic inside. You know, while I was fighting and advocating for the services for my daughter, my, my ex-husband, um, her father, he was dealing with the diagnosis in his own way. And I never fault people who are unable to bounce back or heal on my timeline, because that's something that you have to do on your own. But his path and my path, we were not headed in the same direction. So I filed for divorce. Our divorce proceedings <laughs> were in their fourth year. Yeah, in their fourth year when I decided to throw in the towel. And you would think just two blue collar workers, why would it take so long? But it did. I was tired of fighting. And I was not only working one job, but I was working two jobs because my ex refused to help out with the debt that he helped to create. I worked at the USPS in mail processing at night and I came home, I got my kids off to school and I headed to my second job. I was reading meters for San Diego Gas and Electric. <laughs> so I actually had 16 hours of work in every day, but I made it home in time to meet my kids' school buses in between and cook dinner, get a little sleep and start over again. And there were a couple of things that a couple of good things that came out of that. I was still able to pay the bills and afford extras for my kids. And no one knew what I was doing, not even my kids. <laughs> so if you're wondering how I did it, I did it with a smile. Before the FDA banned the supplement metabolite, I don't know if any of you have ever heard of metabolite, <laughs> but it had ephedra in it. And there were people that were abusing the ephedra. So they banned it. But before then, you know, you take ephedra, you get all this energy. So I had plenty of energy, energy to spare. And I was incredibly fit right then. However, I wasn't getting enough rest because there's a difference between like the rest and the sleep. So I wasn't getting enough rest. I was full of anxiety about going to divorce court. If you've, if you've ever been in divorce court, you know, it's a horrible place. <laughs> um, things don't always turn out the way that you want to. And I was just really worried about my future. I was worried about my kids' future. And I was on the defense daily. I couldn't keep working two jobs and I couldn't keep going to court. And I just sensed that um, we were gonna end up being destroyed, he and I. So I applied for a job transfer and I moved to Atlanta, Georgia. I started at the bottom of my new facility. I had terrible days off. Sometimes it was only one day off, but eventually things got better. I had a sense that I would be okay. I started to bounce back. Um, I was making good money because the way that they ran their facility was way different than the one in San Diego. So we did, we worked on a lot of overtime. So I only needed that one job. But like I said, I started to bounce back. I was making money and um, I was using what I learned from my daughter's attorneys to successfully advocate for her at her IEP meetings. My kids were adjusting. I made a couple of new friends and I was beginning to see some light. I felt better. I think back to Miss Penny and I think I know I'm better because I didn't lay down and wallow in self-pity. I kept moving. What she told me was true. If you stop moving, you stop living. And here I was in action. God replaced the house I was fighting over and he replaced it with a better house. He closed one door and he opened another. Sometimes you, you can't see that when you're in the middle of the fight, you can't see that. I was making good money and um, my retirement got right back on track and I actually ended up retiring from that job. Um, I think it was like the day after my birthday, as soon as I was eligible, I was out. So that worked. Another good thing that happened was I found value in me. I found out that it wasn't the house with the ocean breeze while it was nice. That's not what makes a home. So um, I don't know if any of us ever imagined that we would live through a pandemic during our lifetime. I know I didn't. The pandemic has tested us in ways we can't imagine. Um, the fear of not knowing much at the beginning, it caused so much anxiety because it's a novel, it was a corona novel virus, so it's new. And it caused so much anxiety. I was watching the news daily and I found myself depressed. So I had to back away from the 24 seven news consumption. I'm a, I'm a big news junkie. I like to watch you know, the political news. 
We can't always change what happens, but we can control our attitude and how we respond to what's happening. While it's true that we may never go back to being the same, we can emerge from this better, all of us. Resilience, it can be learned, and I believe it, it can be developed, and I believe it can be built. I found this test online. Well, it's not really a test. It's kind of like a survey. And you can read through them and rate yourself one to five. You can get a pen and or you can add it up in your head. I already done mine. So just add it up from one to five. One, you feel strongly. I'm sorry, one, you feel you strongly disagree and five, you, did I say it right? You strongly disagree and five, you strongly agree. So the first one is I'm usually optimistic. I see difficulties and as temporary and expect to overcome them. So you just rate yourself from one to five. The second one is feelings of anger, loss, and discouragement don't last long. You can put it, you agree one, from one to five. I can tolerate high levels of ambiguity and uncertainty about situations. I adapt quickly to new developments. I'm curious, I ask questions. I'm playful. I find humor in rough situations and can laugh at myself. I learn valuable lessons from my experiences and from the experience of others. I'm good at solving problems. I'm good at making things work well. I'm strong and durable. I hold up well during tough times. I've converted misfortune into good luck and found benefits in bad experiences. And you can add up your total. I hope I'm not going too fast. You can add up your total and you can find where you can rate yourself here. I was a 41. I was highly resilient. So wherever you are in there, if anybody wants to share their total, Like I said, I was uh, a 41. I can't see the, if anybody wants to add their total um, and share with us. Yeah, I'll let you know if there's any comments in the chat room. Yep, Deb is telling us she's a 40. That's awesome. Yes. Jen is a 42. There are highly resilient people here. That's good. Yes, I know, that's awesome. Okay, so these are ways that um, you can build your resilience. You can laugh, smile. I want to encourage you to be like Miss Penny, find things that make you laugh and bring a smile to your face. Number two, so ask for help. If you need help, don't be afraid to ask. Sometimes people are resistant to asking or shy about asking. If you know someone that has super resilience, and you feel like you're struggling, model, just like I did, model what they do to get by. And they can also be a resource for you to ask for help. Don't suffer in silence and shut your shut down on yourself. You can also ask for professional help. I've had professional help. If your HMO offers that, you can go and have professional. I know nowadays they even have help online where you can talk to someone. Talk to your friends, your spouse, or whoever can lend an ear and shed some wisdom. You need um, to find a way to be resilient and bounce forward, not just bounce back, but bounce forward or crawl or however you get there. Number three is be flexible. Things change, plans change, and people change. Four is volunteer. Nothing is a bigger pick-me-up than doing something kind for others, and I'm really big on volunteering. Number five is practice gratitude. I think it was Bruce that was, was it Bruce or Carlos? One of those, I'm sorry, I can't remember. 
was talking about gratitude and this that's important practice gratitude you can get a gratitude journal and you can write in it number six is reflection you have made it through hard days and you survived and you can do it again drawing from past experiences was a big part of my resilience during this time life is a series of series of experiences some better than others but all of them can teach you something. Seven, adapt. Things may not go back to normal and we have to adapt to this change. To be resilient, you acknowledge, you learn and you move forward. Number eight, surround yourself with positive people. My mom used to tell me that misery loves company and I didn't get it back then, but I get it now. There's no greater waste of time than people around, than being around energy vampires who just suck the life out of you. Number nine, is believe in yourself. Having confidence in your ability to cope with the stresses of life can play an important part in your resilience. Becoming more confident in your own abilities, including your ability to respond to and deal with a crisis is a great way to build resilience for the future. Listen for negative comments in your head. When you hear them, practice immediately replacing them with positive ones, such as I can do this. I'm a great mother, I'm a great friend, I'm a great partner, etc. And number 10, get enough sleep and exercise to manage your stress. Being healthy is something we can't take for granted. Taking care of yourself will give you a better shot at how you can respond to emergencies and just in response to life, period. I think, I think it was Bruce that was talking about getting enough exercise and sleep when Denise was saying that she did the, the seven minutes of exercise. I measure myself, I try to get 10,000 steps a day and it feels good. I can go in the basement, I can be alone, I can listen to music or listen to a podcast and get my exercise in. When I come back upstairs, feel good, I'm ready to take on whatever project it is or whatever emergency the day has or just whatever. So I, if there are any questions, I'd be happy to answer any questions for you. Uh, I want to thank you guys for attending my presentation and I really appreciate your attention. I can always be reached at Beverly at takecare.com. I know I'm finishing it kind of early, but I want to leave some time for any questions. Beverly, I wonder if you could expand a little bit on the challenge you faced in getting the diagnosis for your daughter. It was really weird that my HMO would not just say, okay, she has autism. They actually made me leave there a few times saying, okay, well, come back in six months and we'll test for this or we'll test for that. But you could actually test for those things now. It's like nobody wants to use the A word, autism. You can't get any services without a diagnosis. And I, there were two other diagnoses they gave her, but they had nothing to do with her not being able to talk, her lack of eye contact. It was just the weirdest thing that until a, a lawyer actually got involved, there was no diagnosis. And the diagnosis actually came from a psychologist in La Jolla, California. I took my daughter in for a couple of times and she wrote up this whole report. Yes, your daughter's autistic. She's almost four at this point. So it was really frustrating. I wonder if you could share the experience that you had versus the experience that a coworker had in getting a diagnosis. I've had coworkers who their kids got diagnosed at two. They're already, how can I put this? There's no cure for autism, but there are intervention, interventions for autism. But I've had coworkers, I've known other people, even to today, their kids are getting diagnosed at two. And they're being able to go through speech pathologists and learn speech, even in school, the kids, who got diagnosed earlier have better outcomes. And it was weird. It was, I, I hate to attach anything to it, but it's just like every time we went to a doctor, it was like, um, you know, you wait, you wait. 
she'll do this on her own time. It was just the strangest thing. And it's, you know, it makes you angry, but at this point, there's no point in getting angry. One thing that you can't get back is time. It sounds in many ways as if you were minimized within the healthcare system and that for whatever reason. You do have to feel that way? I'm sorry, what? I, I hate to feel that way. It is that way, but I hate to feel that way because it makes you angry. Yes. When you don't know anything about autism. I didn't know anything about autism. When I started researching it, I came up with terms like refrigerator mom and like, what is that? I didn't know anything. I didn't know anyone who had a kid with autism. I was like the first at our facility who shared, oh yeah, my daughter's autistic. When you don't know anything about it, it's hard to do anything. I'm trying to get the doctors to tell me what's going on. Cause I would think that, you know, they would know. It was almost like it was some type of a secret. You guys don't want to say this. And I, you know, I hate to, Put a label on you know the doctors but my daughter has since she has better doctors now i'm curious how you knew it was time to hire an attorney actually it was uh, recommended to me another mother recommended it to me because i didn't want to how can i say you know how people say that kids are retarded they don't usually use that word anymore but um Another mother had mentioned it to me and she said, you know, this is a good attorney, attorney to hire because, you know, she didn't want to call my daughter retarded, but, you know, hey, people hate that word now because kids get bullied about it. But another mother recommended it to me and recommended her to me. And that's when things started really opening up. Okay, so now I have this diagnosis and she has kids that are autistic. And another thing, you know, I have a girl, most boys are autistic. You don't see too, a whole lot of girls that are autistic. And you don't see, a, I don't see a lot of black, there are, I think, I can't really separate it by race, but I didn't know any black families that I could turn to who had autistic kids. And I didn't know anything about autism. So when I was getting my resources, it was from white mothers with boys. And that's just how it turned out. <laughs> Are there any other questions? I'm like super, super early. It's 3.30. Yeah. yeah, Elizabeth is sharing that her brother has, um, she's not sure if her brother has a clear diagnosis. He was always labeled as learning disabled in school. And now we say developmentally disabled. Right. And I think the evolution of our language is so important. We want language that's inclusive and respectful. Right. You know, the, um, the, the slide that I showed you of the checkmates, I think I can back it up. Yes. Oops, I went past it. If you look close on there, did you see what they were, they called the people who lived at the convalescent homes inmates? Oh, <laughs> inmates. If you read wow. on there, it says that. I can't really, it's too small for me to read, but wow. I had to look it up. And that was actually a term for people who were either in prison or in wow. hospitals during that time. Yes. But, is that a typo? <laughs> yeah, they were called inmates. And so our language does evolve. Yes, time. thank goodness. Yes. <laughs> because we want to respect everyone's ability. Right. You, you don't know until you know. I just want to mention that my dad was the editor in chief of the Sears catalog. So I thought that was interesting okay. <laughs> that you had a good experience with Sears. Oh, we used to love Sears. We had the really big Sears and they had the candy departments and the thick catalogs like that. Well, that, yeah, the thick catalogs, there was the wish book. Yeah. You got the wish book in the fall, which is when you started planning for Christmas, right? You went through the wish book to get your Christmas right. for Santa. Yeah. But, you know, back to the, um, what I was saying about the autism, I met, you know, because it's a spectrum disorder, I've met an adult. She didn't get diagnosed till she was an adult. And she looked back on her, she was looking back on her life because she was giving the speech. 
and she, she didn't understand why she felt the way she felt and why people treated her that way. And she was in her 30s before she got diagnosed, which really surprised me. I guess when you look at it like that, I'm, I guess I'm lucky. I don't know. <laughs> but yeah, my daughter, she's now she's almost 28. She'll be 28 this month. So you also have a small business. And I will tell you as a fellow small business owner, it takes resilience to stay in business. It can feel like there are challenges and obstacles, not just every day, but sometimes it feels like every minute and every day. And you're constantly pivoting and adjusting. How do you describe your resilience as a small business owner? Well, for, as far as the pandemic goes. Just, I, in, oh, go ahead, oh, sorry. yeah, go ahead. This um, last year was probably, I sold more puzzles last year than any other year. Cause you know, everybody wanted jigsaw puzzles during the pandemic. And I had put some on eBay and people were bidding. They were outbidding each other. And I, at first I didn't know what was going on because we, you know, we didn't think the, the pandemic would actually reach our shores, but by the time it reached our, over here in the United States, people were going crazy. Puzzles that I was selling for $15, people were bidding 40, 45 bucks on. And it didn't dawn on me, oh, people need something to do because they're stuck at home. The last year was a great year for me. I sold more puzzles. I made more puzzles than ever. And, you know, finally now they're going back to the regular prices. But fortunately, because I'm making my own puzzles, I have my own inventory. On days when, you know, I'm having a bad day or my daughter's having a bad day, I don't have to, I don't have a brick and mortar to go to. I, I can just like, look, I can do this at midnight. I can work on this later. So fortunately, it's that type of business. If I had another type of business, I would probably be out of business. <laughs> it would be too much. It would just be too much. Just learning how to say no and how much that I can handle is just, it's, really instrumental. It's just, I can't handle a whole, whole lot because I don't know what her needs are going to be. Just like when I was preparing for this, I was like, please, please don't let her make a whole lot of noise. <laughs> so fortunately she's downstairs, she's eating her lunch with my son. So you, you just don't know. I, I don't know a whole lot of people who have businesses and I just haven't met them. I'm sure they're out there and have uh, disabled children at home. I'm not real sure. But for me, you know, I just take on what I can take on and that's it. What type of, types of services does your daughter receive now? When you graduate from high school, which they let you stay in Georgia, they let you stay in school till you're 22 years old, almost all of your services are cut off. That's it. You lose your IEP, all of that. If you don't already have uh, your Medicaid waivers, which in Georgia, they say the list is like 10 years long. I think it's more like six years long. That's why it is important that, you know, the bill that I can't put the name of the number on the bill. Uh, Joe Biden was talking about it this week. I don't remember which day it was. It was $400 million, billion dollars, I'm sorry, for the Medicaid. It was to help the seniors and the developmentally disabled adults. That would be pivotal to getting a lot of the kids out into the community and be able to clear up those lists. The lists are like so long, it's just ridiculous. And a lot of that is just for kids wanting to go to a day program. People don't want it. Well, some people don't want it. Some people want the, um, the money to go elsewhere or they don't want, think it should be in an infrastructure bill. But I just feel like let's clear off the list I volunteered with, because, um, you know, I, I put that on the list. It's number four is volunteering. I was a civic leader for Hands on Atlanta for a whole year. And although going to those homes were not my first choice, they were my third choice. And I didn't really want it because I figured I would be crying all day. But <laughs> these people who the developmentally disabled adults who live in these homes, that's the homes that we went out and we would beautify their homes. Those people, if, you, or if people were able to go and visit, they would see that they are proud, they're happy to be amongst their peers. And that's something even I didn't think. That's why I thought I had my own preconceived notions about 
my daughter even living in one of those homes. Because, you know, they have all the men in one home. They have all the women live in a home. Um, for obvious reasons, they separate them because, you know, they still have feelings and things they probably shouldn't be doing. But, yeah, I forgot where I was going with this. But if we could um, have services for them, help for them, it would be such a help. My daughter, she doesn't receive anything other than respite. And because of the pandemic, that just reopened. She just went back to respite two weeks ago. And they will go for a weekend or a week. You can choose. What were you going to say? I just wondered if you could tell us what uh, defined respite, the respite service for us. For the, dis for the developmentally disabled adults, respite is, and they let some kids go sometimes too. You go for, and it's for the caregiver. You, like my daughter, she will go for a weekend. They'll go on Friday evening, and then they will take them in to out in the community. They'll go out to eat, and it's just like five girls for her. In the, they'll go out and eat, or they'll get their nails done. They'll go to the movies, stuff like that, so they can go out in the community. And then they'll go Saturday. They might go to the zoo or Six Flags or something like that. This is pre-pandemic. Um, Sunday they give you the caregiver a chance to go to church and then you pick your kid up or your, I still call her a kid. <laughs> but, or, and then sometimes they'll have, you can choose weekend or a week. And then the week is mon Monday through Thursday. Monday and through Friday, I'm sorry. How often is respite available to you? Right now, pre -pand well, let me go back, pre-pandemic, They'll put a schedule out, let's say in January, and that will cover January, February, and April. And she could go more, but I miss her. So she goes maybe like once a month for the weekend. And then that's supposed to give the caregiver a break. During that time, even though you're, well, from my experience talking to other parents, you're, you're kind of racked with guilt because like, why should your kid have to go to respite for you to get a break. You're supposed to sleep, um, get your blood pressure down or go for a walk or do something for you if you're married, go on a date, stuff like that. But you still feel guilty. I feel guilty and I'm almost in tears every time it happens because I just feel like, I, I know she's having fun. I just, I feel guilty. But it's for the caregiver to take care of themselves. You know, it's interesting. I actually was thinking about respite services this, mor this morning because respite to a family caregiver is different. And your description of what respite feels like does not feel like respite <laughs> to me. What you just described doesn't feel like a break for you. So for instance, one of our other certified caregiving consultants, Brianne, she's on with us today, and she talks about personal growth as respite for her. So she gets involved in learning and expanding her knowledge. That's respite. So I think we have to be really open-minded about how respite is delivered for families. And wouldn't it be great if it wasn't just one option, if there was another option for you to feel like you were getting a break, but you were still with your daughter? That is true. They do have programs where people can come into your house, but that's on that other list. That's on that right. List. Yes. That's, long. Right. Yes. Right. So Beverly, I'm curious if you could really feel like you were getting a break, what would that break be like for you? A guilt-free break? Yes. Um, I would be able to wake up on my own. It's so important for me to wake up on my own. I don't like being startled awake. And I would like to be able to take a shower without fearing the house is going to be burnt down. Right. Yes. Um, I don't, I don't know. I would like to feel like I'm not the entertainment because with my daughter, she she's never had a friend. I'm, I'm it. I would like to feel like I'm not the entertainment, so you know, I would so I can do things that I like to do without having to stop and entertain or I have to get breakfast, lunch, dinner, and, and all, everything in between. And I know that it, it's it makes me feel bad saying it, but 
after all these years, you just, you know, that just becomes the routine and you forget. So like when you do get a little time off, you start feeling guilty. Well, I do. You feel guilty. You, you almost don't know what to do with yourself because it's not something that happens all the time. Absolutely. I think relaxing during a caregiving experience is very difficult to do because you're going from 60 miles an hour and then you're supposed to just be able to all of a sudden relax. And I think that's impossible. And it's hard to relax your mind. It is. Because the mind keeps going. And what you described in ter terms of respite is really a release of pressure. You yeah. want to be able to do the simple tasks during your day without the pressure of worrying or the pressure to speed through the shower so that you can be available before something happens. <laughs> yes. It, it's this yeah. odd feeling. It's an odd feeling. And you hate for it to become like so routine, but it has to just become routine. I know when I gave my sister a break from, for watching my mom, I spent all the time making sure her chest was going up and down. Are you breathing? Yes. And then when it was shallow, I'd go closer and try to listen in, like, because I didn't want anything to happen. <laughs> it's, it's amazing how you get involved in, in that and it just becomes your normal. And then when something else happens, you feel, oh my God, is this how life really is? <laughs> it's living in a state of high alert. Yes. And in order to relax, you have to have an ability to take a break from that high alert. But yes. again, it's, not, you, it's really difficult to go from high alert to no alert without any kind of transition. Right. <laughs> I think it would be helpful if there was some kind of transition during that respite and some ability to have support around the guilt. It, it would be life-changing. It really would. Because the, the guilt is understandable because you are providing so much for your daughter. Of course, you're going to worry, will she get what she needs without me? even if it's just for two and a half days. Exactly. And I wonder, you know, like, what does she think? She right. Left her off and yes. Left her. Yes. <laughs> right. Yeah. Of course. Of course. You don't want this to feel like for her, it's because you can't manage or it's a burden. Right. right. You want her to always know she is loved and she is not a burden. She's an an integral part of the family, a necessary part of the family. So it is odd then that a family member leaves the family. It, yes. is, it <laughs> is odd. It is odd. Because yeah, you don't do it with your other kids, you know? It's just really weird. Yes. You, yeah. It's hard to say that you need a break. Of course. I, I know I need breaks. Right. And it was because of a doctor that told me, if something happens to you, Who's going to take care of her? So you have to take care of you. Hard to hear. It's also hard to do, right? Yes. Because <laughs> your job as a mother is to take care of her. Yes. It's very complicated. Very complicated. It's not easy. And I think it's important to talk about that emotional component of respite services. <laughs> and yes. that respite has to be flexible for what works with the family and every family caregiver's definition of getting a break can be different and so flexibility around how people get a break I think is important too. That is true. Okay so we do have a request for your link to your website for puzzles. It is. Do you have it on a slide by chance? It's right there on the behind me. It's puzzlebilities.com. Oh, you know what? It's a little hard. It's a, yeah. Oh, you, you know what? It? Yeah. Um, it's P-U-Z-Z-L-E-B-I-L-I-T-I-E-S.com. Okay. I just typed it into the chat room. Okay. Thank you so much, Beverly. We kind of took a little tangent. We kind of veered off, but it was fascinating. <laughs> okay. It was just fascinating. Thank you so much, Beverly. Thank, Thank you, you for um, 
your consideration. Thank you. Okay, everybody, we're going to take a 10 minute break.